Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 191 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source. For strength and conditioning information, you can try out traincoach.com for three days for just a buck. And if you have a staff of two or more, you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about a few forum threads, including one on regeneration, one on on high hamstring syndrome and one called quad cramping in the active straight leg raise. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. For the SC Equipment experts with Perform Better, we have Erin McGurr. She joins us for the huge summer sale, wall padding and customization for facilities. For the Results Fitness University Business and Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove is on to talk about the importance of marketing and the Results Fitness Marketing Checklist. We have a special segment continuing with Alistair McCall from the McCall Method. Alistair continues his series on the seven keys to being a great coach. Today he talks about the ability to adapt as a coach. And for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach, I have on Dr. Stuart McGill, professor of spine biomechanics at the University of Waterloo. He's also the author of a new book called The Back Mechanic. So today is part two of this interview. So uh, if you haven't listened to the first part, go back and check out the last episode. Today he continues his talk with uh, going over the eight easy assessments that he has in the book. He's going to coach us through the big three exercises. He's going to talk about transfer of training and his thoughts on Philip Beach's work and uh, that and so much more coming up with Dr. McGill. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I am doing great, Anthony. I'm just back to great, though. <laughs> I'm out of it, Victorious. We got to get you going on that one. Um, no. <laughs> Coach, the forum has really been jumping. We've had some really good, interesting discussions. And I'm going to start out with uh, regeneration um, because I think there there were some great responses, really interesting stuff from, from Devin McConnell and, and a few others. Um, and I think with you, what you always do, you're pretty consistent about – making things pretty practical you're talking about you know your main basic regeneration strategies eating rolling stretching you know that would be your top three and after that cool down rides and ice baths and you're like buy big landscape trash cans so those are all things i think everybody can do i want you to talk about regen and and you know i mean like look ideally in a perfect world I, when I went to athletes' performance, it was nice to be able to get in the cold pool and get out into the jacuzzi and go back and forth between those. But, like, you know, those are things that, you know, certainly not even the closest to the average facility, the above-average facility, can't even really afford. Talk to us about this, uh, this idea of regeneration and, and some of the things that we're trying to do from a practical standpoint. Well, well I think there's a couple of things, and... I think we hit on it a while ago, and I'm trying to remember who should get the credit, but there was another thread, I believe, or article or podcast interview where somebody had said exactly what Devin said about being careful with your regeneration strategies because at some point you want the body to adapt to stress. And you know who it was? It was Nick Grantham. I don't know why that just came into my head, but it was Nick Grantham yeah. who said, I don't know if necessarily all of this is good, which is a really good point to begin with. And then, obviously, the, the guy, and I can't think who it was that most of the original question, but he's working with a basketball team that it sounds like is in preseason because they're going twice a day and they're lifting. So that's where you really need to think about your recovery strategies. But... I think the biggest thing, and we've seen this, we just got done with a camp with our um, national team women, and we went through the whole camp without 
a significant soft tissue injury again, which is probably the third or fourth time that we've done this. But we're very, very religious about rolling, stretching, rolling, stretching, warming up, you know, warm up, cool down, warm up, cool down. There's a strength and conditioning coach out there. Mike Vaughn was out there, and I was out there, and Kevin Gibbs was out there. And we're running these on a really regular basis. So I think the biggest thing is for people to not miss the simple stuff. Because what happens is everybody, as is, like, it's the way in our profession. Everybody's looking, but what about the sexy stuff? What about the new stuff? What about the stuff that costs a lot of money? Like, well, who cares about all that shit? Are you doing the other stuff you're supposed to do? Do you roll prior to every practice? Do you stretch prior to every practice? Does everybody go through a dynamic form up prior to every practice? Do you have a cool down where you basically repeat the rolling and the stretching process again? If you're not doing that, then don't worry about the next level. And I think that's the same thing that we go through from a nutrition standpoint. Okay, are you, you know, people, what about supplements? It's like, well, yeah, are you eating three meals a day? Are you eating real food? Are you doing the simple things that you need to do? And, well, what about beta alanine? What about creatine? What about, it's like, no, 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 slow down. What about eating three times a day? What about breakfast? What about post-workout shake? So I think that's hopefully what we can keep doing to people is continue trying to bring them back to the simple center of things and say, okay, here's the simple stuff that we need to make sure we're doing. And then, yeah, if you've got unlimited budget and, again, you can afford hunt cold tubs and you can afford Norman Tech boots and you can afford – two or three full massage therapists, I would tell people, hey, my number one choice would be massage. Except for the fact that you got to pay somebody about 80 bucks an hour to do it. You can get one person done an hour by one person. That's a very inefficient regeneration strategy in a team setting or in any kind of group setting, in spite of the fact that it's a really good regeneration strategy in a big theoretical setting. He'd go with the Norman Tech boots, you know, 20 minutes per person. I forget what they cost, but they're expensive. There's all these things. Then you jump into the debate about, well, cold, you know, we don't want to use cold. That stuff drives me out of my mind in terms of we have all these people now who decide, oh, common sense doesn't make any sense anymore because someone said it doesn't. It's like one of those, well, I went to a seminar and the guy said the world was actually flat. Like, yeah, but it's been around for a really long time, and that's been that's been working for us. Do you really want to change your opinion because you heard some guy say it was flat? And that's what people say. Oh, ice is bad. Say, really? Have you been hurt lately? Have you tried putting ice on something? And people are like, yeah, well, when I do, it feels better. Well, that should tell you something, shouldn't it? You know, in spite of somebody else telling you it's a bad idea, you should heat it. And then you heat it, and it blows up like a balloon. And you think, gee, that was the wrong idea, except so-and-so says that's what you're supposed to do. You know, and that's the same person who's telling you, know, wrap a band around it, call your circulation off. You know what I mean? It's like all this shit that people throw against the wall to be different, to be contrarian, that runs very contrary to, I think, all of the common sense stuff that we know to be true. Yeah. How's that for a long rambling? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Coach, I want to challenge the massage a little bit, though. I guess it's more of a question than a challenge. But, like, because I got a guy who, who gets a regular massage, and she beats him up. So I actually, you know, it's not like some kind of nice thing where you're taking a nap or anything. I mean, she's, she's going really hard on him. Um, and so I feel like that's always a good thing kind of – post-workout, if we're not working out the next day, if he's having a light day. I don't really feel like I've, I kind of look at those kind of massages as really almost similar to a workout where we're doing some things to kind of damage the tissue to kind of create that super compensation, right? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think I probably agree and disagree a little bit in the sense that mm-hmm. I think there are some people that can maybe be a little too aggressive based on the person that they're with. I always like to say that um, you've got to know the density of the person that you're dealing with. This goes back sort of to the body tempering thing and why someone like Donnie Thompson likes body tempering and why it might be a bad idea for a 135 pound woman. So I think we've got to make sure that with massage, it's not a one size fits all type of thing. And, and the reality is, there's different types of massages. If you're looking 
or when I'm thinking massage work for an injured area, I want that to be very, very aggressive to, as you said, to actually try to promote some healing. But there may be, you know, you're, you're disrupting the tissues to make that happen. That's not probably what would fall in the regeneration category. But I think more of the kind of fluffy effleurage type massage is probably going to be very, very good for recovery in the sense, and that's probably closer to the, to the foam rolling idea. So it's, I think it can be kind of an either or, but I still think, I don't think there's anything better than the hands of a good massage therapist. And I think that's the difference. And we talk about this all the time. It's like everything else in terms of everything that we do that involves human touch, whether it's ART or muscle activation technique or massage or grasping, is really subject to the provider. And so if you've got a really good provider who has really good feel, you're probably going to get a really good result. If you have a not so good provider who has not so good feel, you're probably going to get not quite the same result. I think that's just part of the deal. All right, good stuff. Um, Coach, there's another good thread, high hamstring syndrome tendinopathy. And uh, it led to Jeff Kubos had posted a really great video um, that kind of explained it, I guess, because I did not watch it. But um, you had loved it. You had oh, you got to watch it. I posted that as a great video. I can't believe you didn't watch that video. you got to watch that video. No, I feel bad. Um, so tell us a little Must bit about... Must see TV. Is this the old commercial? The what? Must see TV. Oh, you must see TV. The old commercial video. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you got to seriously, you got to watch it because it's one of those like, oh wow, I never thought about that videos. Because I clicked it because I didn't want to comment. I didn't want to be on the thread and not be in a situation where I had um, actually read. I think sometimes. When someone pull, it drives me crazy when someone will post a link or a video or about an article or whatever, and then people will keep posting without reading it. How can you keep posting without reading it, without watching it, or without somehow taking it in? Because that's the context as it moves on. And people say, oh, yeah, I think this. I didn't read the article. And like, well, you should probably stop commenting. <laughs> if you didn't read the article and somebody posted the article, then you're a little bit out of the conversation here. But that video was awesome when you it, – it so explained to me why when we talk about this idea of does it hurt, that does it hurt makes so much sense because you start looking at people thinking, oh, that's probably why that hurt, but that didn't. That's probably why this range of motion is pain-free, but this larger range of motion is painful. So and you'll understand that when you watch the clip. But it's um, it was really cool. That was actually a really good thread because I think as we talk about with a lot of these threads, they kind of like an amoeba. You know what I mean? They just sort of mm-hmm. spread all over the place into areas that you didn't expect them to spread into. But that's one I think everybody that listens to the podcast, if you're a site member, should make sure they go on the forum and start reading start to finish, watch that video that Jeff put up. As I said, I put the video up by itself in terms of, I think I just dubbed it great video or something like that. Yeah. And put it, you know, it's probably yeah. something we should move to the homepage yeah. for a video of the week, yeah. even just the link, because it's, it's one of those really, I think, groundbreaking. It's right up there with, if I showed you the diaphragm one, have you seen, I think I showed it in functional strength code six. We were in, uh, uh, Rhode Island, mm-hmm. and the video of the diaphragm yeah. working, and you're like, oh, I get what Sue was talking about all those times now. Whereas, you know, when you're kind of thinking like it goes up and comes down, and it goes, you know, it goes up and they inhale and down, and it's like, wow, how does that work? And then you see the video, and you're like, oh, I know exactly how it works. Yeah. Because I saw the video. <laughs> um, a picture's worth a thousand words, a moving picture, 10,000. There you go. Um, Coach, another good one I thought, and I, I, the quad cramping in the active straight leg raise test, I thought this was a good one because 
Um, well, first of all, he had asked, he said, when performing the ASLR, the quad goes into cramp. What causes this and what are some approaches you found successful in uh, relieving this issue? I think this was great because, you know, Brett Jones, uh, Elspeth, you, all you guys were chiming in kind of with certain, like different correctives. And I think it, it really talks, and you had mentioned this towards the end of the thread about this is why really watching, you know, because, you know, the, the, it, it, we're, we're talking about iliopsoas and it's connected to the back and what's happening at the low back and the pelvis, you know, don't just watch the moving leg. Talk to us about this thread and some things that you kind of look at when you see the quad cramping like that, what are some things you're going to do and look for? Well, I think, um, and I don't remember who it was in the thread, but someone was talking about the idea uh, are they laterally flexing? Because they were saying, oh, I've done the uh, kind of the Sarman flexing test, you know, come up, hold it above 90. But I always say to somebody, somebody can pass that test if you just look at it and said, okay, all they got to do is hold their knee above 90 for 10 seconds. But they don't pass that test if they engage in any one of three compensations. Do they lean back? Do they side bend? Or do they get a cramp? at the end of the 10 seconds. All those really are failures. So I think that's the difference in terms of there's, there can be sort of the literal translation, okay, here's the test, here's what you do. But then there's that, you would talk about that coach's eye part, but here's what you're watching to see, do any of these things happen? And that's why I think so often on the site, we'll say, can you post a video? Because what people think think they see and what people see can oftentimes be different. And I think, again, there are people on site, great people, well-meaning people, but they may not have the same coach's eye that somebody who's 20 years ahead of them might have. Someone 20 years ahead might look, look and go, ah, I don't think I like that because of blank. And that's where I, I thought this was a really good, uh, Right again. I love the fact. I appreciate guys like Jamie. I really appreciate the guys who put themselves out there, whether it's Avi or whether it's Jamie or whether it's Bray Tucker or whether there's a lot of people, or I guess there's not a lot of people on the site. And sometimes it's the same people who are very willing. And I just did a seminar that I did for USA Hockey. And one of the things that I always, I have a slide from John Maxwell that talks about, are you teachable? And one of the things in this list is am I willing to ask questions that will display my ignorance? And I love the people that are willing to do it on the site because they're the ones who facilitate so much learning for everybody else by having that willingness to say, hey, I, I don't get it. I'm going to throw it out there. And I may look like an idiot, but I'm going to learn a lot. And I say the same thing in my seminars all the time. You have two choices. One is be stupid. The other is to remain stupid. If you sit there in silence, you're just stupid. If you open your mouth and say, what about this? You may look stupid, but shortly thereafter, you're going to get smart again and you're going to have some answers. And and I've always said, I had no problem sitting, whether it was in Sarman seminars or in the Guild seminars or in any of these seminars, and asking people questions and saying, I don't understand that. Can you explain what that means? Because obviously, like everybody, but it was a time when I knew a lot less than I know now. And I know that sounds absurd to even say, because of course there was a time when you knew a lot less than you know now. But I think some people are so intimidated and they're so worried about, I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to ask a dumb question. And I'm like, God, please ask more stupid questions. It's such a great teaching tool. Absolutely. Well, we've been asking, I've been asking some dumb questions here for about nine years. I don't feel any smoke. So. <laughs> anyway, um, coach, we're, we're going to leave it on that note. And uh, thanks for coming on today. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. You say you don't feel any smarter, but you are. And you know you are. <laughs> That's the difference. But I think the key is to continue to, to think of what the next stupid question is. Okay. What's the next thing that I don't understand? that I can throw out there so that I do understand. Absolutely. That's the name of the game in my book. All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better, and I'm here with Aaron McGurr, fresh off of the last summit of the summer in Long Beach. E, how you doing? 
I'm good. I could have actually stayed in bed a little longer today, but um, besides being tired, I'm awesome. All right. <laughs> Long Beach was great. As always, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Love the people, love the uh, facility. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, so tell us about your uh, end of summer sale really quick. Our end of summer sale is still going on. It's weird to think, um, first of all, that the summits are all over, so we can't talk about that, but it's weird to also look at the end of summer sale and realize that we're almost done one month of it. So that's even more strange because time's going a little bit too fast for my liking. But we do have our end of summer sale, which is the lowest prices of the season. A lot of our manufacturers will give us lower pricing for these two months. That way we can pass that discount along. So everything from half racks, bumper plates, dumbbells, assault bikes, victory racks, um, those are on sale. And then we do have some of our miscellaneous items on sale, kettlebells, ropes, kettlebell racks. Um, a lot of our bands, TRXs, boxes, jump ropes, things like that. So definitely check it out. Um, again, it is the lowest prices we give of this season. So now would be the time to stock up. All right. Very cool. E, I know uh, we were talking earlier, you wanted to talk about um, some of the wall padding. And uh, I can certainly... Uh, and talk about that as well as I do have them. So uh, it's funny. You were like, ah, it might be a little boring, but you're getting a lot of calls about them. So talk to us about uh, about wall padding. Yeah. Well, the reason I wanted to kind of mention it, um, and again, there's nothing too exciting about wall pads, but we do get a lot of people calling in um, asking more about customization for their facility. So I know there's always the option of getting logo plates, logo dumbbells, logo head wraps you know, certain pieces of equipment and certain colors to match. But the one thing that a lot of facilities have been doing, and we have it here at our place, are wall pads. Um, and it's not that we use them because, you know, we're running and we need them as a safety feature at the end of a straightaway, um, which some people have, which is cool. But we have been getting more and more facilities just getting a couple pads with their logo on it. Um, it does give it more of a professional look. But the one thing we have here that has been, pretty cool that a lot of people are starting to do in their facilities are um, a med ball target. So I know in a lot of the victory racks and a lot of the move strong racks, there's med ball attachments that you can do. The one thing I don't like about those are usually they're at the top of a rack. So they're nine feet or 10 feet high um, and they're tiny, but just throwing up a medicine ball, you know, nine feet in the air, can be a little weird to me. I don't know. Some people like it. But um, the one thing I like about the wall pads is that we have med ball targets that we got screened on ours. So it just gives you something, whether it's a chest pass or, you know, a rotational throw, things like that. Um, the target's right there. It reduces the noise. Again, some people don't have cinder block walls that they can just throw medicine balls at. But these actually allow people to throw medicine balls at walls. Um, again, with logos, with med ball targets, we've had people put all sorts of designs on them. Uh, so it does give it a cool look, serves dual purpose when you're throwing med balls on there. But um, I just think it's, it's something unique that a lot of people may not think about to use. Um, but again, even on our facility design page, we have the Miami Dolphins, University of Rhode Island, our facility, just to name a couple off the top of my head that did have it do um, use it for a couple different things. But Again, cheap way to do it, but it adds, I think, a lot to to your facility. Yeah, and I think in this day of branding, you know, excessive branding, I mean, we, you know, I have a, I have one, and I always, when I'm going to shoot a video or a picture, I always kind of stand in front of it because my big five iron logo is on it. So that's number one. Number two is, um, as you know, I got my client that time, he wanted to throw med balls in the house. And, and let me tell you something. I mean, you know, you can have people catching balls, but it's not the greatest idea. I don't care if they're great athletes, which is probably not a, a worse idea because you really don't want them breaking any fingers. But, um, but like from the perspective of not having anybody catch those things, um, you know, we had his carpenter ha built, actually, I got, I think it was four mats all together. He doubled them up, two on each side. And uh, he had like a movable, well, you know, mat wall, a, a med ball wall. So he was able to kind of still throw the med balls without like throwing them through sheetrock. So 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's definitely an option. And I, like I got the idea from shrinkcoats.com. Some people had done that uh, as well, made uh, specific med ball walls. So yeah, man, wall mats. So call Erin up and she will help you out with your movable med ball walls. So E. Maybe not movable, but <laughs> definitely the best. Yeah. She'd be able to add wheels. but um, I could. Oh, awesome. E, thanks for coming on today and talking about the sale and the um, the wall padding and some of the logos and, and branding on, on some of the equipment as well. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Business of Fitness segment with Results Fitness University. This is Rachel Cosgrove, and today I want to talk about the topic of marketing. Back when we first opened our business, I had a friend who was into marketing. He loved marketing. And we used to have an argument about how could we change the world? And of course, because I was a trainer and I was in, I still am a trainer and I believe that we could change the world through healthy nutrition, exercise, if we could help, if we could inspire more people to eat right, to exercise and to really see the benefits of what we do, then they would be more productive. And then of course we would change the world. And he used to always argue that, well, no, because if we can't reach the people who need that information, then we can't change the world. So marketing is actually the way to change the world. And over the year, over the the years of running our business and um, really now we've been open 17 years and I have to admit that he was correct. Uh, at this point, because if it is so true that if you don't know how to market, it doesn't matter how great you are as a fitness professional, it doesn't matter you know what you know if you don't know how to reach the people who need the information that you know. So marketing is one of the things that we have to learn. We have to start to realize that that's something we need to spend time on to get to know. So today I want to just run through our, our marketing checklist at Results Fitness. Anytime we run an ad, anytime we you know, um, put something out that we want to try to capture the people that we want to get the information to. We use this checklist to make sure we have all of the, the vital pieces of a good marketing piece that's going to really hit our audience to get them to take action. And so real quick, if you want to get your pens and pencils out, this is a checklist you want to write down and you want to put somewhere where you are creating your marketing pieces. Um, first thing, grabber or hook. You got to have some way to hook those people in. Speak exact directly to them. The goal is to actually enter the conversation that's already happening in their head. So getting to know what that conversation is and and picking up where they left off. So we got to have that grabber or that hook. Um, a story. You've got to have a powerful story. And if you aren't currently collecting stories from your clients, start doing that. Start to collect and not testimonials, stories. Really, um, you know, where were they when they joined with you? What what was their turning point? And then where are they now? And really, what have you done for them, you know, through that time? So really, you know, starting to gather those powerful stories that will resonate with your target audience and including that in your marketing. Um, next are images. You got to have um, with that story a powerful image. And this isn't necessarily a before and an after. Um, really, we're just looking for an image that's going to resonate again with that, that target audience to really tell them you're the solution to their problem and you can help them to feel the way they want to feel and look the way they want to look and perform the way they want to perform. So really um, starting to collect those powerful images. It is powerful to get your clients, um, not necessarily a picture of you in a half top or shirtless. Uh, that's not as uh, motivating as some of us think might think it is, as great shape as everybody's in, we actually would love more to see those images of your clients, images that are um, people just like the potential client you're trying to reach. Um, differentiator, start to think of how could you um, set yourself apart from other people in your area and really, uh, you know, aside, there's so much competition these days, how do you really um, differentiate yourself? So you want to have some kind of a differentiator in that marketing piece, something that sets you apart. A compelling offer. So what do you want them to do? Uh, really, we need to make sure that there's, you know, there's a compelling offer, something that's going to really make me want to do business with you, make me want to come into your gym, make me want to meet with you. So what is that compelling offer? And then the next one on the checklist is, this is an important one, and I'm actually going to go over this in even more detail on the next segment of the Strength Coach podcast. So tune in next time to hear a little bit more about this one. But this one is the takeaway risk a guarantee. So you got to have a bold guarantee. Um, what is your guarantee? Are you, you know, it, and again, I'm going to go over this in more detail at the next segment. So tune into that, but we got to have some kind of a guarantee and we'll talk about that more next time. Um, next, we got to have a call to action. What do you want them to do? So whenever people put together a marketing piece, sometimes they don't think about 
um, that final, what do you want them to do? What's your call to action? Where are you, where do you want them? Do you want them to call? Do you want them to show up? Do you want them to go to a website? Do you want them to fill out a form? What do you want them to do? So make sure you have that call to action because if you have a really powerful marketing piece and they're ready to take action, if they don't know what they're supposed to do, then you might end up not actually getting them to take action. And then last but not least, and this is an important one, is your contact information. And you might not think that I need to say that, but I have seen so many people put together really beautiful marketing pieces, Facebook ads, things that, you know, and they don't actually put down how to reach them. Um, you know, whether it is your website, your phone number, you know, really what do you want them to do again? You know, what is that call to action? And then make sure you have that contact information. Make sure you do include you know, I would include at least your phone number and your website um, and probably your email address. Most people do at this point. I know for us, we've seen most of our clients are, you know, really they see our marketing pieces, especially if it's on Facebook uh, late at night. And so, you know, they do want to take action right away. And then if they call us, we're not open. So um, making sure they have some way to take action right away. So put that checklist up somewhere, take action on that. Uh, you know, as you put your marketing pieces together, make sure you have all of those things included in your marketing piece. So tune in next time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that bold guarantee. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, segment of the business of fitness segment. Again, this is results fitness university, and we do have an event coming up, uh, October 13th, 14th, and 15th. So check out results, for more information on that. Thanks everyone. Have a great week. Hi everyone. Alistair McCaw here again. And as always great to be back with you on the strength coach podcast. If you might remember in episode one and two of this segment, we looked at the first two chapters of my book, the seven keys to being a great coach. In those two chapters, we spoke about the importance of setting your standards and building your method or philosophy. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at chapter three, and that is about, all, that is about the ability to adapt as a coach. One thing I've noticed in all great coaches and trainers is that they have an incredible ad- ability to adapt and adjust, no matter what the situation or who they may be dealing with. We just have to think of great coaches such as the legendary Coach K of Duke Basketball, Nick Boliteri, the famous tennis coach who worked with no less than 10 world number one players. Or Pep Guardiola, coach of powerhouse European soccer clubs such as Barcelona and Bayern Munich. These were coaches who could embrace, adjust, and adapt to the environment, culture, and individual personalities in a unique way. They not only held high standards, but understood how to connect with their players better. I always like to compare a great coach to a chameleon as they're able to change their colors, metaphorically speaking, to suit and adapt the environment they're in. Great coaches are able to handle change and the unexpected, whether it's their best player getting injured during a big match, or maybe you're a personal trainer or a strength coach in a gym, and there might be limited space, for example. You're able to adapt, make decisions, and switch to a solution mindset. Great coaches have a plan in place but they're always flexible to change. Great coaches love a good challenge because it gives them an opportunity to build trust and a connection with their athletes. In a way, they love to show their mettle under pressure. In the end, it's all about being able to make decisions, adapt, and find solutions. They're prepared for the best, but always expect the unexpected. Just last week, I was listening to a podcast which fe- featured motivational guru Tony Robbins. For those who don't know Robbins, He's consulted leading uh, figures such as world presidents, Fortune 500 company CEOs, and superstars. He stated that the most outstanding quality of all these successful people was that they were all great solution finders, and they were able to adapt to change. Another area I look at in this chapter is about the importance of adapting to the generation you're working with. The great coach understands that the key to successful coaching is in knowing their players or clients and connecting with them. Like the saying goes, if you can't connect, you can't direct. In his book, The Iway Generation, Tim Elmore talks about the generation born in the 1990s. He goes into great detail how dramatically the last 10 to 20 years has changed the way the world and this generation thinks, communicates, and socializes. One thing I have no problem being labeled is being old-fashioned in the fundamentals. In fact, I'll always choose fundamentals over fancy. But the one thing I've had to change over the years is the way I communicate and deliver my message. 
I've learned that today's generation don't like to listen to long lectures or speeches. Neither are they big on reading books. In today's world, trends and technologies are changing quickly. We just have to look at how fast social media trends change. For example, just last week, I asked a group of kids how many check their Facebook each day. Only five kids out of 40 raised their hands. It's now all Snapchat and Instagram. One thing is for certain. If we as coaches don't adapt to the generation we're working with or keep up to date and stay connected, we're going to struggle to effectively coach and connect. Finally, we need to accept that change happens and learning never stops. We need to view change as good, and when accepted, it typically is followed by personal or professional growth. I believe that how you embrace change and adapt will determine how far you go. Great coaches understand that even though the sport they're coaching doesn't change, the athletes do. So in summary, all great coaches are able to adapt and adjust. Great coaches are like chameleons and adapt to their environments. They embrace change and they're invested in learning and understanding the generation they're working with. Coaches, that's all from me for today. To connect with me, get over to my Twitter, at Alistair McCaw, and you can also find my book, The Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach, on Amazon.com. Thanks for, so much for tuning in, and I look forward to bringing you in the next chapter, and that will be Chapter 4, The Energy You Bring as a Coach. Until then, I'm Alistair McCall, wishing you greatness today. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach. And again, I have on Dr. Stuart McGill, and uh, this is part two. So if you haven't heard part one, I uh, highly recommend you to go back. Doc, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, good morning once again, Anthony. All right, well, um, we went over uh, on the last episode, we kind of set a good foundation of some of your past work, and we were talking about your book, The Back Mechanic, your new book, The Secret to uh, a Healthy Back, Your Doctor Isn't Telling You. And uh, so I wanted to kind of focus a little bit more on um, on the book today and, and some of the assessments, because like I said to you earlier in the uh, in part one was, I think, you know, this is a great book for trainers and, and train coaches as well because there's, there's, there's a lot in it to be learned and, and to kind of, you know, I don't want to say dumbed down, but for people like me, I need, it needs to be dumbed down a little bit. Um, so uh, let's go over your assessments. And, and, you know, you started, and well, give us a brief, because, you know, obviously the audience is, uh, we're familiar with some of these things that you're going to be talking about, and just why, uh, let's talk about the purpose of each assessment, what we're looking for, and, uh, and we'll start from there. So test one, the seated pull on chair. Yeah, can I just give a, a, a couple of sentences sure. to give a perspective on, on these tests? Yep. Um, and uh, you're right, it was a great surprise to me. I, I wrote that book with the target audience being the lay public. Uh, and I, I did mention in the previous uh, session that it was a really difficult challenge for me. And, and thank goodness I had a, a, a good editor that uh, was uh, not a scientist that <laughs> kept honing our, yeah. our language down. But, but here's, here's the issue. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to start with, with quite a uh, condemnation of some training practice because more than half of the patients I see have been created by trainers and clinicians. That's quite an indictment. However, I will also turn right around and say trainers are the keepers of movement. They have the greatest ability of any clinician in healthcare to make major change in massive health issues. Look at diabetes. The most effective intervention for diabetes is exercise, good matched exercise, the appropriate volume and all the rest of it, not pills or anything else. Who owns exercise and the prescription of it? Um, and the same can be said for just about every muscul musculoskeletal disorder. If you get the volume wrong, the wrong exercise, you will hurt the person. If you get it right, it's magic. So um, having said that, uh, it's, it's essential for every trainer to have the skill to take a person with a bit of pain and build that person to be able to tolerate training. And if they don't get it, they will lose a client. That person won't be able to tolerate their sessions. But if they can do little things right off the bat, 
do little postural changes that relieve some of the chronic stress from the, the sensitized tissues, all of a sudden they're building a person that can tolerate uh, training and work with them for 20 minutes. Soon that will work into half an hour, etc. So th- th- that's the backdrop of, uh, of all of this. So the pain provocative tests, I, I really have a full set of them in my clinical textbook. That, that's the low back disorders textbook, but it, but it can be an overwhelming textbook. I know that, but that's for people who really want to be true masters of, of the craft. Um, but for trainers, I tried to come up with eight tests that are fairly easy to administer but there are some coaching tricks to them and if we can discuss the uh, nuances of each test right away the client and the trainer will get to know how to reduce the pain sensitivity and and build that tolerable training capacity so so that, that's a very important uh, issue but that's the background for all of these so shall i proceed with uh, the first test then? absolutely Okay, so the person sits on a chair or a stool is even better, and their hands go down and grab the seat pan of the stool. I I hope I'm able to describe and, and paint this picture for your listenership. Then you have the person just, oh, you posture them so they're upright, neutral posture. And then you have them pull up. On the, on the seat pan, which will compress their back. And they pull up maybe, again, whatever is appropriate. A bigger, stronger person is going to have to pull a little harder. But you're basically loading compressively the back. And then ask them, is that comfortable? Or did that cause a bit of discomfort? And then have them slouch and repeat. And you will see right away if posture is driving the pain. If they slouch and say, oh, yeah, no, that, 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 that replicates my pain symptoms, you just say, okay, well, we know now that we are going to avoid that pain trigger and allow it to desensitize in perfect consistency with neuroscience and pain science. Um, and then you might have them sit up very high and extend and see if that creates a pain trigger. Uh, or again, it might relieve their pain. And then we play with neural tensions just by Uh, flexing the neck or the cervical spine, have them look down and that might uh, increase their back pain or it might decrease their back pain. If they have what's called a neural underhook in their back, that might decrease their pain. Um, So you're really getting a... uh, uh, an idea of how posture is uh, linked to uh, a, a specific pain trigger or not. But it also shows the trainer what exercises they can start with to build that uh, training capacity. So is that good enough? Can I go on to test two? Or? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Again, you know, these are all in the book and they're all described and illustrated. So um, just wanted to go... Uh, That was perfect. Let's go on to the heel drop. Okay, the heel drop, the person stands. And uh, again, if you have an osteoporotic older person, you have to be very gentle doing these things. If you have a more robust person, you can let them be a bit more robust. But basically, the person relaxes in a standing posture. They go up on their toes and they bounce down on their, their heels. Now, again, there's you have to be judicious on that. But generally, you will create about one and a half times body weight compressed of impulse down the spine. Now, the key the first time was to have the person relaxed. And they might say, oh, yeah, you know, my, my right toe just, just had that familiar numb feeling. Well, you say, okay, we've just identified that a ballistic or impulsive compression is your pain trigger. Now, let's immediately see if we can find a technique to take your pain away and make you tolerable to training. I would put my fingers on their obliques. So say uh, five or six inches lateral to the navel. And then I'll I'll push in with my fingers into their uh, oblique muscles and say, now push my fingers out. And the cue is to push out laterally. And then I'll say, now repeat the bump. Did that increase or decrease your pain? And say, oh, that's magical. You just took my the, the 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 buzz out of my toe and my hamstring pain away and my back pain. Or they might say, oh, you just made my pain worse. So now we've identified the person. You just can't tolerate the compression yet 
from that abdominal muscle contraction. So we might try something else. I might give a different cue for stiffening. I might say, okay, stand there. Anti-shrug. Push down your shoulders with your pecs and lats. Take your thumbs and externally rotate your arms around into a hitchhiking kind of posture, pulling down. Now, but let your abdominal muscles go. Let them relax. Now repeat the bump. And then they, they might say, oh, you know, that took my pain away. So immediately we're going to um, create the discomfort and, and search once again immediately for a way to, to take their pain away. So it shows the trainer and the person little strategies that they can employ to again build this pain-free, uh, tolerable training capacity. So are we okay for test number three? Absolutely. Let's do it. The tummy okay. lie. Okay. The tummy lie. Have the client lay on their tummy. Now, it, th th this can be um, following uh, a client who says, you know, I can go for a walk for half an hour, no problem. But if I sit at my computer for 15 minutes, I get back pain. So right away, we're starting to suspect a more discogenic type of, of, it might not be the disc, but chances are it probably is, um, they've got a little bit of a disc bulge and uh, the tummy lie is the polar opposite. So they lay on their tummy and their hands or palms down stacked under their forehead, let's say, um, and then they just simply lay there. And uh, then they stand up after two or three minutes. If their back pain is less, we've just proven that depressurizing the discs, and that tummy lie, by the way, is, is we've proven is a, a disc pressure reducing maneuver. Uh, if they stand up and say, you know what, my, my pain is gone, we, again, we've, we've, it's quite a powerful sign that they have uh, uh, something dynamic in their back that's driven by posture, probably a dynamic disc bulge. Now, take that same person, another person, we'll put them down into that same test, the tummy lie, and they'll say, oh, you know, that's actually ramping up my back. Okay, try pushing your eyebrow down into the table five pounds. Oh, doc, you just took my pain away. Well, let's examine that mechanism. Now we're probing the system. We're adding a little bit of anterior chain stiffness. And it just proved that there was a way to make it tolerable. So these are very, very powerful cues that if they're interpreted properly, guide the trainer and the person on movement strategies to uh, take their pain away. And, you know, in the previous session, we, we had the conversation about pain science and those who believe that the way we move doesn't matter, just move. Well, I'm proving with every single one of these tests, probing scientifically and systematically, every one of these tests shows you what causes pain and takes it away. It's, it's very instructive and liberating for, for the patient and, and uh, uh, turns the trainer into uh, an expert. Fourth test, ready for that standing extension? Absolutely, let's do it. Okay, so you have the client stand and they lift their chin uh, an inch or so, and they start to bend backwards into extension. And the trainer might want to hold their shoulders on this one and see if this causes pain. So we'll, we'll determine if they have extension-driven pain. And then they drop each shoulder to the right or to the left. And this, we've measured, starts to load the neural arch and facet joints and whatnot. Now, if the person has no pain doing this, their facet joints and their neural arch is clear that they don't have pain from those tissues. So it's really a, a pain elimination test. Um, but say they do get a bit of discomfort. If it's just to one side, that, that tells us a bit of uh, information that it's probably a unilateral uh, structure. Um, it still could be a disc bulge, by the way. But standing on one leg, say the pain was on the right-hand side, ask them, stand on your right leg. And now let's repeat the pain provocation test. And they might say, oh, you know what? You just took my pain away. Well, again, the mechanism of standing on one leg causes you to activate your lateral frontal plane core muscles. It shows whether or not that takes the pain away. Well, that's exactly um, what the, uh, the side plank does. 
Right. Anyway, so, you know, we're starting to build candidate uh, exercises for them. And we're learning whether stability and, and any time you add stiffness to the body, that's what the motor control uses to, to control. So we're really probing and learning a lot about, about the pain relief. So test number five, the, the wall plank. Mm -hmm. This basically is to give the person a tool to reduce their pain. So the person um, stands uh, against the wall, their feet are a couple of uh, feet back from the wall, they're on their elbows wall planking. Now we coach them what is spine flexion and extension and then we coach them what is hip flexion and extension. So if you have a person that posture is driving their pain in their spine and they happen to be at the grocery store pushing the, the grocery cart full of groceries and that familiar pain is starting to, to sink in, they now have a strategy to stop, stand up, maybe sniff a bit of air. That would be a, a stiffening procedure that the trainer's already discovered and have the person move their spine because they know now how to do that into the posture of relief and off they go again so it, it can be a very powerful movement strategy and again if you can continue to wind down pain throughout the day the trainer is building training capacity and i might add the great trainers also watch the patient how do they tie their shoes how do they get on and off the toilet um how do they uh sit how do they stand? All of these things, a, a real savvy trainer is coaching these patterns throughout daily life and building that, that pain, uh, sorry, that, that the, the uh, exercise tolerant uh, uh, client. Test number six, um, you have the patient or client stand. They hold their arms out in front of them and you give them a weight to hold. Now that weight is obviously variable uh, and matched to the person. It might be five pounds, it might be 30 pounds. But what that does is it compresses the back. It turns on the back muscles. It creates moment, not movement, but moment. Uh, and if the person says, oh, you know, that's my familiar pain, you've just uh, identified the person that can't tolerate compression yet. You're going to have to be fairly judicious in uh, mild, low-grade exercises. Someone who has an implate fracture, uh, I, I've had two in my life, and uh, uh, you know these are shown on MRIs with modic changes and all that kind of thing. The fact of the matter is that person will be really compressive and tolerant for a year, maybe a year and a half. There's nothing you can do about it except wind down the pain sensitivity by getting them to move better, have more appropriate posture and whatnot. Um, try and reduce their load throughout the day with the techniques of spine hygiene, which we, we talk about in the book. Uh, next test is the pelvic uh, motion test. So this is performed with the client standing and they do what we, um I'll look I'll just cut to the, the 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 chase here Anthony we call it the midnight movement have you got what I'm after here oh, I <laughs> tilt the pelvis back and forth getting a good flexion and extension motion in the spine now um that will show if motion triggers pain in their back now just have them do it uh without any load and then for a bigger person we might put a bare uh, olympic bar on their back so now they have 40 pounds on their back and they repeat the motion and we we will see but we found that test quite by accident we were having people uh do that because we were testing length change of spine muscle and all of that and it was interesting that we had to stop the study because people were breaking into pain so quickly by moving their spine back and forth uh, under load. Um, the next one, uh, let's see. Oh, that was the standing posture assessment, test number eight. This will show the trainer if the standing posture is stealing their training capacity. So have a person stand and just palpate their low back muscles either side. And uh, if they stand up nice and tall and get the center of mass of their upper body over their hips, those back muscles will shut off and they'll completely relax. And then have the person bend forward and you'll find there's a, trick, there's a, a, a point that immediately those back muscles bang on. Now just have the person stand 
and you'll see whether they're standing in muscle contracture and tension or not. And if they are, show them how to pull their hips forward um, and, and shut those back muscles off. When the back muscles are off, say, now poke your chin. The muscles come on. Pull your chin in. The muscles come off. Round your shoulders. Ah, oh, the muscles came on. Pull your shoulders back and the muscles came off. So it's so powerful in liberating the client and showing them their posture matters. It reduces the muscular back cramps they get. It reduces the cumulative load they have on a sensitized spine. It's all about, by the end of the day, creating a client who can train with them. And now the, cl now the trainer can really create a wonderful progression that can build a foundation for pain-free movement. And, you know, if the person sits a lot and they need some hip mobility, I mean, all the things you do at Strength Coach, I, I know you and Mike Boyle have, have been so, um, uh, well, really the apostles of doing those corrections, undoing the chronic uh, loading of whatever that person's habitual life is. Anyway. There's a little bit of background and a few nuances of those uh, tests. Great stuff. And the, the thing I really, the reason why I wanted you to go over those was a lot of times with some assessments, like let's take the FMS, for example, you know, there it is, there's specific tools you need. This is really eight things really easy that you can do that kind of, uh, you don't really need a lot. You don't need anything, you know, maybe the five pound or 10 pound weight for the one test. But for the most part, these are really simple to do. They're things that we're, we're already kind of trained in. We're watching movement anyway. So I think these are all things that anybody can do. So highly recommended um, inside the book uh, to, to go and, and get, get this book and, and to really dive a little bit deeper with some of the stuff. So good, good, good work there, Stu. Um, yeah, yeah. Anthony, can I, I'm, I'm yeah. so curious. Can, I'm going to turn the tables mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask you something. Sure. May I? Yeah, go ahead. How, how, how do you viscerally feel when you hear people, uh, and it might be just someone blabbing away on Facebook, that now posture doesn't matter and, and movement skill doesn't matter. It, 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 you, you will create fear in people. What, what's your visceral reaction to that? Well, I think for, for certain things, um, for me, I get we get angry, and Mike and I talk a lot about this, is with some of the trainers that we don't feel ever work in the trenches because, A, you know, everyone is so different. Um, you can't just throw a blanket over over um, anything, really. So for me, I, I, you, I, we do get annoyed at the, those things. And, and, you know, look, for some people, like you said, look, I work with golfers. So like you said about posture, it's movement habit. It's getting them to kind of create these habits. Golfers, it takes forever, like posture, for them to change a golf swing. And it's going to take a long time and a lot of work to get. And I think that's where we see this thing is that where we see these kind of comments is that people don't want to do that work. They don't want to, um, they don't want to kind of do the works required to make, uh, to make those changes. Cause they're going to take, uh, they're going to take a while. So I think for, for me, I, I think everybody's so different that, you know, I kind of try to take those things with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, what, what really twigged with me was your comment on people in the trenches. You, you, you know, I, I, you, you get a few people back to performing so they're winning Olympic medals and, and back in, in uh, pro sports and whatnot. And if you're not able to do that, I, I, I question how much time you've spent in the trenches. But I know, you know, you and Mike have, you've built those people, you, you, you know what works. And it's a little hard to take sometimes of these, 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 I call them the kids who live in their mother's basement, but they have huge opinions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's still, look, even, even looking at something like your chapter seven was removing the cause of pain, learning basic movement tools. If you've ever worked with anybody, you will understand how important that chapter is on teaching someone how to get out of a chair. 
or the, the way to pick things up. And same thing with the spine hygiene, um, expanding the pain-free abilities uh, and teaching people these things in every day, uh, every, every, you know, the, the activities of daily living. And you'll, you'll, you know, you can understand um, somebody might blow that off. Look, you know, just be like, "Well, that's what that." I don't need to worry about that. But those are those are the things that transfer to the to life, and that are really the most important. And so, um, that being can, said, can I interject yeah, with two, two brief comments sure. on that one? First of all, and then you know, none of us can t- give names of our clients with with patient and client confidentiality. But one fella, he's been very vocal on the uh, internet, uh, and he, he he set the, the 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 squat record. But he came to me as a patient. And his spine hygiene throughout the day was awful. He was sitting poorly. He was standing poorly. He was bending over and, you know, just a flush of the toilet was hurting his back. And yet fixing all of those things were the foundation to get his training back again so he could set another world record. Um, uh, What was the other point? Oh, I know what I was going to say. Here's another one that you will love. We did a training study with the Pensacola Fire Department. We had three groups of firefighters, ones who were just a control group. The next group just did exercise, and you you know the style of training that I'm talking about. They did 10 burpees, and then they did Olympic lifts, 10 of those, and, you know, just keep banging out reps. We didn't really worry about the form. It was just more about the reps. And then the third group was very much what you guys do. It was uh, it was actually the Exos coaches that coached all the movement. They coached good movement, forms, postures, etc. Before the study started, we all measured the firefighters doing firefighting tasks and their movement competency and how closely they got to injury mechanisms prior to the exercise sessions. Then afterwards, we measured them doing, again, breaching holes in in roofs, knocking down doors, advancing loaded fire hoses, real tests. Those who did the uh, fitness training, just banging out reps, their movement patterns, afterwards doing the firefighting tasks were even worse. But those who were well coached, where the trainers and coaches really paid attention to the Uh, movement patterns, those movement patterns transferred one-to-one to to the fire ground, and they moved better and avoided injury mechanisms. So there's very, very strong evidence that the efforts that coaches put into their craft matters. Absolutely. That's our number one goal, right? To transfer to, uh, to, like yeah, well, that's the first. Or, yeah. That's the first study, and that cost a huge amount of money. But uh, you know, again, I just get viscerally. I, I react to these the kids who live in their mother's basement and aren't educated <laughs> or or scholarly enough to read the literature and the science that's available. Anyway, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Stu, let's move on. You know, if we look at. Um, you have a chapter called Building a Resilient Back, the non-negotiable big three exercise. And what I, my comment for this would be, you know, there's a lot of us that are already doing these three. But my problem is that they're not coached right because why are people still having back pain or kind of think these things don't work? And, and I think you go really deep into your big three, the curl-up, side plank, and bird dog. So I think it would be useful – can you just coach us through these three and talk to us about maybe some of the mistakes that you've seen and maybe in some of the big like perform better summit lectures where you've seen people kind of co- the other trainers in the beginning coaching these things and some of the mistakes they're making. So coach us through <laughs> these three and s- tell us about some of the mistakes they're making. Oh, I, I know. I, again, if, if it's, it's just breaks my heart. If, if I, I go on the internet or someone says, Hey, go to this, this YouTube. And, and someone says, this is a McGill big three exercise and I'll see them. And it's absolutely slaughtered. It's designed to cause back pain. <laughs> I'd help it. So uh, it's a good question. 
Well, uh, again, just a little bit of a background of where those big three exercises came from, because they didn't come uh, out of a hat. Actually, a lot of rocket science went into that. We knew that if you can control the back and avoid the pain triggers and you control it through appropriate stiffness and proper hip mobility and shoulder mobility and all the rest of it, that we will reduce a person's pain triggers. So we looked at all kinds of candidate exercises, so-called stabilization and mobilization exercises, and we evaluated them for their ability to spare the spine for people who have pain triggers and guarantee stability. The three that bubbled to the top every time was this form of the curl up for the front, the side plank for frontal plane or the sides, and the bird dog for the back muscles. There's no single exercise that will do it. Um, so the, the curl up, uh, most people come up way too far and they rotate about the lumbar spine. So uh, have the client place their hands, palms down under the low back, and try and get the center of rotation imaged into the middle of the sternum and only come up half an inch. That's all. Now, at that point, you can add deeper breathing uh, and you want, you could give the uh, client a cue, again, have them push their oblique muscles out laterally into the uh, coach's fingers. Um, one leg bent and the other straight reduces neural tension and the tendency for uh, neural tension pain. Switch the legs halfway through. Only do 10 uh, second holds. Uh, the reason for that is longer. It, with someone with a pain history, you're risking uh, cramps and overload. Um, uh, build the sets on the Russian descending pyramid, uh, etc. Moving on to the side plank, again, for someone who's uh, highly sensitized, they just might want to do a side plank standing against the wall or the countertop. But moving to the floor enhances the ratio of muscle challenge to sparing the spine of load. You have to do it on the floor. There's, there's no other option there. So the trick there is to position the spine in its most tolerable posture. So getting a nice tall posture, um, whether they're, they're supporting themselves from the uh, feet or knees. A funny story. Um, I know uh, the standard for a lot of people is have the client with the feet stacked. Well, I'll, I'll tell you how that came about um, I, because I've had people say, oh, McGill, you don't promote the feet stacked. What's wrong with you? They don't realize that I, I wrote the first program for the American College of Sports Medicine in the 90s where we first put in the description for the big three. Um, the editor of that uh, monograph said, look, Stu, we're behind in production. Uh, we, we've got the um, uh, photographs of these uh, exercises. Our artist will draw them, but we don't have time for you to proof them. The artist drew the feet stacked. I had the feet where the top one is in front. <laughs> so that's how it became the American College of, <laughs> of uh, uh, Sports Medicine um, standard. It was a pure mistake, and I was the author of it. So, you know, again, the kids in the mother's basement have no idea where those exercises and the forms <laughs> came from. But that's the story on that one. But the feet should be split because it allows progressions into a front plank and then dropping elbows and all of the dynamic ballistic progressions that we can create out of that uh, side plank. Uh, moving on to the bird dog um, you know, again, a, a pain patient, they might just be able to raise one arm. That's all they can do. Uh, but we work a lot in the initial posture. Get the knees apart to open up and free, liberate the hips. Uh, get a neutral lumbar posture and a neutral thoracic posture. Don't have the ha head cranked up in, in cervical extension, etc. Um, and then there's all kinds of other little tricks and, you know, give credit where it's due. Um, I learn so much by uh, hanging out with you guys at Perform Better, Mike and, and uh, Dan John. Dan John told me, um, well, we developed a standing bird dog for people with hip replacement and knee replacement. And they just stood at a counter, held onto the counter with, say, their left arm and extended their right arm and their left leg. And Dan showed me that if you push the heel away of the extended leg, 
it, it tidies up the person's balance, which was brilliant. And so there's another little trick uh, again, giving full uh, credit to Dan, when we measured that, it increased the stiffness through the core, gave more gluteal and hamstring activation. It was a perfect cue for the right patient at the right time. But uh, anyway, it's it's all about in all of those uh, exercises, choosing the form and morphing it to really enhance the risk reward ratio. And the great trainers are, are good at that. The bad trainers are poor at it, and they're creating patients. <laughs> <laughs> the ones at uh, living in your mother's basement dot com. So um, exactly, <laughs> Stu. I've taken enough of your time. So let's finish up with. Um, I sent you an article that Mike Boyle wrote, um, and it's on uh, some of Philip Beach's work about you know getting the feet a much more proprioceptive rich environment to help with back pain. I guess the, the nerves of the feet are innervated with the, the same nerves as the lumbar spine and pelvic floor. So Mike, it's worked amazing for Mike. He just cannot talk enough about his rock mats and, um, and walking on rocks. And, and what are your thoughts on this and some of the, maybe some of the science behind it? Yeah, well, I did read the article, and uh, it, well, first I'm I'm going to start here and, and say I can assure you that this is not the primary mechanism of pain generation. It's not going to solve uh, the major determinants of back pain. Yeah, you know, we just can't get away from the person needing to be aware of their specific pain triggers and address it as we've discussed for these these last two episodes but back to this article by mike because there's some really interesting elements there um he discusses the the surface stimulation um over the soles of the feet uh, from from a, a perspective of nerve meridians and that kind of thing, and I, I have to tell you, you're way out of my area of expertise now, so I can't comment on that aspect uh, any further. He, he, he might be right on that. But we go back a few years ago to Vladimir Yonda, the great Czechoslovakian neurologist, and he used the same kind of techniques. And he noticed that when the foot is labile and you're having to use the muscles of the feet to walk over uh, the, the, the small rocks and, and uneven surfaces and whatnot, that they stimulate activity in the feet themselves themselves and up the legs and that radiates right up to the hips and in fact modulates hip patterns and, and gluteal muscles and whatnot um so it, it it may be just a slightly different mechanism that that mike is describing but this will really help uh some clients there's no doubt about it uh, and and I, I know you know uh, I, I've had hip replacement uh, <laughs> 60 years of uh, <laughs> at, at some times rather extreme uh, training in athletics but anyway the, the point being uh, I will actively take my shoes off and, and seek out rough rough ground and, and just walk barefoot because of the uh, relaxation that I get through the feet. It's like having a good foot massage, but also the restoration of motor control. Um, when they replace your hips, they cut out your, your, your hip, hip capsule with all the proprioceptors in there. You've got to re-educate your brain. I mean, it was such a humbling experience for me just to relearn knee extension after surgery because on one leg it was gone and I had to do cross-education exercises. You know, here... Here's me. You know, they send you to hip school before you have your hips replaced. And they say, well, this is how you're going to walk upstairs. And, and my arrogance, I said, oh, give me a break. I can walk up the stairs on my hands if I have to. <laughs> uh, you know, you don't, you don't need to coach me. That. But, man, after the surgery and those, the, all those receptors are cut away, you know, and, and one side of my glutes because of the procedure I, I had where we're filleted off the bone and whatnot – it was it was humbling to to reeducate all of those, and I, I did use uneven surfaces to do that, and I I uh, I, I continue uh, with it today very much. Uh, but Mike's idea about it, it it improving his sleep pattern once again, I'm I'm very sympathetic to that. You're getting a good foot massage, and uh, uh, the, the the final bit that's just coming to my mind now is 
you know, with our diets, with our exercise, if we can go back to evolutionary roots, we've all evolved this body because we, we, we were the survivors and had appropriate adapt, uh, adaptation. Um, shoes haven't been around that long. And to go back and, and to the evolutionary roots and just getting your feet working again and becoming athletic again. And, uh, you know, I, I would add to Mike's ideas, and I know he is a proponent of skipping, skipping barefoot, walking over the rough surfaces and whatnot, are all elements of returning to these evolutionary roots, which is what your neural system and... and uh, a shock absorption system and whatnot are all tuned to do. So th there's a little bit of a, uh, a teleologic finish, I guess, <laughs> to to uh, a little bit of uh, neurology and mechanics. But uh, anyway, I enjoyed the article, and there might be uh, just a little bit more um, thoughts added to Mike's. All right, great stuff. Well, I'll remind everybody uh, the book, uh, Dr. McGill's new book is the Back Mechanic, The Secrets to a Healthy Spine, Your Doctor Isn't Telling You. This is not just a book for the lay public. Uh, this is a perfect book for trainers, so uh, make sure you go out there and you get it. So, Stu, thanks so much for coming on, doing a two-part. I mean, I took a lot of your time today, so I, I really appreciate it. I know my listeners definitely appreciate it. Uh, it's always uh, always great to, to talk to you, and it's always interesting to hear your opinions on, on what's happening out there. So thanks so much for coming on today. Oh, well, again, Anthony, as I, I said in segment one, I love your, your interviewing style. Your, your, just, uh, your mind is, is just so good at locking on to the uh, issues. So thank you very much. Um, and if I can just, would you permit me to give the, the source for the book? Absolutely. Yeah, it is on Amazon.com or Amazon.ca or Amazon.co.uk for those folks over in uh, England. And um, but it, you can also uh, get it uh, nationally and internationally on uh, BackfitPro.com, and and they'll see some of our other things that may uh, help as well. Uh, so it's just as how it sounds: uh, b a c k f i t p r o dot com. All right, great. And we'll have a link to that at strengthcoachpodcast.com as well for everyone. Great. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 191 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Pryor, Aaron McGurn, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Don't forget the huge summer sale going on right now. Thanks to Coach Poyle and Dr. Stuart McGill for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Alistair McCall from the McCall Method for his seven keys to being a great coach. And of course, remember you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for just $1, three days, just a buck. If you decide to stay on after your trial membership, you'll get charged $14.95 if you stay on for the monthly or $129. You're going to save $30 on that one if you sign up for the year. Once your three-day trial is over and you become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Wells' two books. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name's Anthony Randall. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.